All right, so let's talk about discharge line temperature. When I'm talking about discharge line temperature, that is the line that goes between the compressor and the condenser coil. If you've got a heat pump, that can be kind of tricky to find, but it's the part that goes generally into the top of the reversing valve. It's the smaller single line on one side by itself, and that feeds into your condenser coil. Obviously, again, on a heat pump in heating mode, that condenser coil is inside. In cooling mode, it's outside. And it is not the same as the liquid line. So we're used to taking our pressures and our liquid line temperatures in order to calculate subcooling on the liquid line. Your discharge pressure is going to be slightly higher than your liquid line temperature, and that varies on the design of the condenser, so you can't just use one number for that. But your discharge line temperature is going to be significantly higher than that of your liquid line. And this goes down to what your condenser does. Your condenser first takes superheated vapor, vapor into the compressor, then you have vapor coming out of the compressor on the discharge line, and it changes it slowly to fully liquid at the bottom until we get a liquid seal at the bottom of the condenser on most of our condensers that don't use a receiver. So you actually get subcooling, which means fully liquid in the bottom of that condenser. But the discharge line is fully vapor, just in the same way that the suction line going into the compressor is fully vapor. The compressor is a vapor pump. And there's several things that can impact our discharge line temperature, but first let's talk about why we take it. So it is a good thing to measure. A lot of people will point out in residential split systems, it's kind of a hard measurement to take. With modern Bluetooth probes, it makes it significantly easier because you can at least go in and put the Bluetooth temperature clamp on your discharge line and then put everything together and test it. But you still have to take it back apart in many cases in order to get it off. There are some brands like Train where you can easily access the discharge line in the side panel, which is handy for this measurement. But even then, when we're taking a discharge line measurement, it's important where you take it. Because the discharge line is fully vapor, the temperature of that discharge line changes pretty quick as soon as it gets away from the compressor. So when we say measuring discharge line temperature, we're talking about six inches away from the compressor. That's sort of the industry standard location for measuring discharge line temperature. And what are you looking for? Well, there's some general rules of thumb. Generally speaking, you don't want to see on most compressors a discharge line temperature over 225 degrees. Although in some cases you'll see with certain compressors that up to 250 degrees is acceptable. And I'm sure there are some cases that are either higher or lower than that. But those are just some standard temperatures that we're looking for. And it's important to keep in mind that when we measure 225 degrees at that sort of six inches away from the compressor, the actual temperature inside the compressor in the compression chamber or in an old school reciprocating compressor, we would say at the actual discharge valve, that temperature is going to be around 70 degrees warmer than the temperature that we're measuring. There's already that much temperature change from the inside of that compressor in the compression chamber to the outside. And the reason that's important is that when we get to around 300 plus degrees in that range, you begin to have issues. You begin to have your oil breaking down. And again, it does depend slightly on the lubricant but you do begin to get some oil breakdown, the compressor can actually start to be damaged, just both from the temperature itself inside the compressor and from the breakdown of lubricant in the oil. Also, the higher the temperatures, the less viscous the oil becomes. So less viscous is just another way of saying thinner, and thinner oil does not lubricate as well, and so you'll get a breakdown of lubrication. All this to say that we don't want our compressors to run hot if we can help it. But in order to do anything about it, we need to understand some of the reasons why a compressor runs hot. And in turn, what are some conditions in the system that cause a compressor to run cool? So the first thing to kind of get your head around is this idea of compression ratio. We talk about this in several tech tips and other videos. In simple terms, compression ratio is the ratio of absolute head pressure or absolute discharge pressure divided by absolute suction pressure. So all you do is you take your discharge pressure, you add in atmospheric pressure because that's what makes it absolute. You take PSIG or your gauge pressure and you add 14.7. Then you take your suction pressure and you add 14.7. You divide that absolute suction from the absolute head pressure and that gives you a compression ratio. Kind of modern air conditioning, we've typically said, you know, three, a compression ratio of around three is what we typically see. And even higher efficiency equipment now, 2.7 is a number that we see a lot with compression ratio. But again, even with that, we're often not measuring discharge pressure, we're measuring liquid pressure, which also kind of creates a unrealistic compression ratio or unrealistically low. But in many cases in refrigeration, you'll see compression ratios up near 10 or sometimes even over 10. And the higher the compression ratio, the hotter the compressor tends to get and the more other cooling you may tend to need. And so a common example of other types of cooling in a really simple way would be if you're working on market refrigeration systems, big refrigeration systems, and they're low temperature pieces of equipment. 
which often will run higher compression ratios because of the low suction pressure, you'll see they often have head fans on them. So this is just a fan that mounts to the top of that semi-hermetic compressor and it keeps the compressor cool. But this is also where you'll see things like vapor injection, liquid injection, interstage cooling, things like this, where you actually actively cool that compressor in order to keep the temperature down rather than just relying on that single stage compression with that very high compression ratio. So let's talk about the factors in compression ratio. The factors are high head pressure, also known as high condensing temperature. So the higher your head pressure or the hotter your condenser is, and in many cases we're working with air to air systems, that means that we're rejecting that heat to the outside air. So in other words, the hotter outside it is, the higher your head pressure is, the higher that discharge temperature is going to be. And in turn, the temperature inside the compressor, which can cause compressor damage, that can result in high discharge temperature. Things like dirty condensers or anything that restricts that condenser airflow that drives that head pressure up, that can result in that high compression ratio and also result in high discharge temperatures. Systems that are significantly overcharged, especially with TXV metering devices or electronic expansion valves, where the electronic expansion valve is controlling the superheat, keeping it down. But when we add more refrigerant, we take up more space in that condenser with liquid, which drives the head pressure up. Just as simple as, you know, you know that if you vastly overcharge a system, then it's going to result in high head pressure. That high head pressure results in high compression ratio. Higher head equals higher compression ratio. Also, anything that causes your suction pressure to be lower than it should be. This can be anything from restrictions. It could be metering devices that are under feeding, meaning not feeding the evaporator coil with enough refrigerant. It could be low load. So it could be cases where if you're working on refrigeration, it could just be that the box was set too cold. And so that load is too low on the evaporator coil. It could be if it's an air conditioner that the indoor temperature is far too low or more commonly you have an airflow problem. So the ductwork is inadequate or the filter is dirty or the evaporator coil is clogged. Those things can all cause low load, which result in low suction pressure, which results in something called low mass flow rate. And so this is important to understand because a lot of people imagine that it's just the temperature of the return gas. In other words, many people believe that what the temperature of the suction line is dictates what the temperature of the discharge line will be. So if you have a colder suction line, you'll have a colder or a lower discharge temperature. But that isn't necessarily true because you could potentially have a cold suction line, but a low mass flow rate because of low load or low airflow over the evaporator coil. In summary, what do we need in order to keep a compressor cool? We want to have a clean condenser. We need to have proper airflow over the condenser. We need to have proper charge. If we have a charge that is too high, meaning we have way too much refrigerant in the system, that can result in high head pressure, which can result in compressor overheating. But let's say we have a charge that's way too low. We don't have enough refrigerant in the system. That can result in the evaporator being starved, which can result in low suction pressure and low mass flow rate, meaning that there's not enough of that refrigerant coming back to the compressor. Because the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that it is the refrigerant in a refrigerant-cooled compressor that cools the compressor. If you don't have enough refrigerant moving back, that compressor is also going to tend to overheat. So again, in order to keep a compressor from running hot, we need to look at obvious things. Is our suction pressure what it should be? Is our airflow over our evaporator coil what it should be? Are we overcharged? Are we undercharged? Is our condenser coil dirty? Are the outdoor temperatures extremely high? That can result in that compressor running hot. Is our suction pressure extremely low due to a restriction or something like a line dryer clogging? That can cause the compressor to run hot. All of this simply is to say that that compressor needs to operate within its operating envelope. And that's something that Copeland talks about a lot. Emerson Copeland, makers of the Copeland compressors, they talk about that a lot. So let's actually look at their app quickly so I can show you how we can kind of show the effects of different system conditions on that temperature and what can happen if we operate the system outside of its design operating envelope or the conditions that it's designed to operate. So two apps I want you to have. One is the Copeland Mobile app and the other is the AE Bulletins app. With these two apps, again, this is if you're working with a Copeland compressor, you can understand what's going on with that compressor, but also give you some just general information that can help you understand how almost any compressor is going to work. So let's take a look. All right, so we're just going to pick a random compressor from my previous history here. We'll go with the ZP16 scroll compressor, and we're going to go up to performance for, these, for this purpose. Now, you can look at rated performance, you can look at full performance, but I, for this purpose, I'm going to go into dynamic performance, so that way we can actually change the operating conditions that the system is operating in. So you can see we have an evaporator temperature of 45 and a condensing temperature of 130, which would be typical kind of operating conditions for an air conditioning compressor. 10 degrees of superheat, 
15 degrees of total subcooling. So let's take a look at what our discharge temperature would be under these conditions. This is going to give us a lot of additional information, which is also really cool. EER, compressor capacity, mass flow rate. But let's take a look down at our discharge line temperature, 199.85. So we can see that it is high, but it's below that 225 degree temperature that we want to stay under. But let's change some of our information here. Let's just change our evaporator temperature without changing anything else. So we're keeping our return gas temperature the same, which would mean that this system has a pretty high superheat at the compressor. So we have an evaporator superheat of 10 degrees, but we have 30 degrees of superheat out at the compressor, which would be a case if you had a long line set, something like that, and maybe poor insulation. Now let's calculate. So what you're going to notice is our discharge temperature is now dangerously high. And that's occurred because our mass flow rate has decreased. The amount of refrigerant returning to our compressor is less because now we have lighter return gas because we have a lower evaporator temperature. And this would be common if you had, say, a dirty evaporator coil or low airflow. You can see just by reducing that airflow over the evaporator coil, which resulted in a colder evaporator coil, that discharge temperature is increased. Again, that's assuming that a return gas temperature is still 65 degrees. Now let's take this same unit and let's increase our condensing temperature, which would be maybe a case of a dirty condenser along with a dirty evaporator coil. This would be kind of how this system could potentially operate. We see our mass flow rate dropped further because now our head pressure is higher, and now we're in the danger zone. Now we're at a 245 degree discharge temperature. Let's go the other direction. Let's change our condensing temperature to 110 degrees which is something that you would see on a warm summer day without it being too hot. And let's change our evaporator temperature to 40 degrees. This would be a very common sort of operating condition. Let's change our return gas temperature because let's say that we're only picking up 5 degrees of temperature in our suction line before it returns to our compressor. So that would mean that we have an evaporator temperature of 40, but 10 degrees of superheat, that would be 50. So this would be a 55 degree return gas temperature. This would be a pretty healthy operating air conditioning system. Now we can see our discharge temperature is all the way down at 165, a much lower and safer temperature for the compressor to operate and will cause the compressor to last longer. The oil won't break down, the compressor doesn't run as hot. We can also see that our EER numbers are up, our mass flow rate is way up, which results in better system efficiency. All of this to say, all we did here was get an evaporator coil that's at a more realistic temperature for a system with proper airflow, realistic condensing temperature for a 90 degree day at 110 degrees, we get a much better performing compressor. Just going to show you how AE bulletins have some really good information on this topic. This one is AE17-1260, and it talks about compressor overheating, which has a lot of really good information. This was originally written in 1993, but it was updated in 2010, and it talks about the importance of temperature control in the compressor. Here it talks about 275-degree discharge line temperatures representing a certain failure temperature condition, 250 being a danger level, and 225 kind of being the typical number that you want to stay below. Here it shows the impacts of different condensing temperatures, return gas temperatures on the cylinder discharge temperature. But you can see, just by typing in discharge temperature, there's quite a few bulletins that have information about discharge temperatures. We have oil management, discus compressors, a lot more specific information. Let's open up another bulletin. Here you can see the operating envelope for some of these compressors, with different refrigerants. The one below shows R410A, and you can see here it's showing it with the evaporator temperature in Fahrenheit in the bottom horizontal axis and the condensing temperature in Fahrenheit in the side vertical axis on the left. So this set of conditions with inside the envelope is what it's designed to operate in, and the only way that you're going to achieve that 225 or below discharge temperature with these compressors. All right, so hopefully you understand the importance of discharge temperature. We're not talking about the liquid line. We're talking about the discharge line. So that is the high pressure line between the condenser and the compressor and what that line can tell you about system operation and longevity. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.